Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to join today's event, CEO Talk, Building a Green Future. Last November, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and the International Finance Corporation jointly launched the alliance to help banks develop the solutions necessary to encourage commercial banks in Asia to adopt strategies and targets to become greener. Riding on the success of our inaugural event, the Alliance is hosting this roundtable on green building. CEOs and senior executives of leading green developers and financiers are here with us to share their first-hand experiences and intelligence on green building development, financing and investment. Today, we're delighted to have Mr. Paolo De Bol, Global Senior Director, Financial Institution Group of the International Finance Corporation to deliver opening remarks, followed by a keynote speech by Mr. Peter Babesh, Chief Executive Officer of City Asia Pacific. After that, there will be a roundtable discussion moderated by Emin Lau, Deputy Chief Executive of the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. Participants are welcome to post questions for the floor Q&A session. To kick off the roundtable, may I invite Paolo to deliver the opening remarks. Paolo, please. Good morning. I'm Paolo de Bolle, Global Director for the Financial Sector at IFC, a member of the World Bank Group and the largest development finance institution focused on the private sector and emerging markets. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the CEO talk hosted by the Alliance for Green Commercial Banks and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority. IFC launched the Alliance last November to bring together financial institutions, research institutions, and innovative technology providers. Our objective is to accelerate the adoption of green banking and increase financing available for climate investments. Our panel today will talk about green buildings and the role financial institutions play in their development. Climate finance, including financing for green buildings, is a strategic pillar for IFC. Climate investments represent about 30% of our long-term financing and we expect to increase it to 35% between 2021 and 2025. Cities in emerging markets are quickly expanding to keep up with the population growth and rapid urbanization. The floor area of buildings that dot our skylines is expected to double by 2060. At the same time, buildings and their construction account for almost 40% of global energy CO2 emissions. Data shows that green buildings are higher value, lower risk assets. Besides lowering energy consumption and operational costs, they typically achieve higher sales premium and attract and retain more tenants, ensuring a more continuous revenue stream. They can also help investors and owners manage the risks associated with the transition to a lower carbon economy. Indeed, a recent report we published indicates that green buildings represent a significant low carbon investment opportunity in emerging markets, almost 25 trillion by 2030. In East Asia and Pacific alone, this figure is estimated at 16 trillion. Forward-thinking financial institutions can take the lead in shaping and accelerating this multi-trillion dollar, yet relatively nascent market. Also important to highlight is that significant regulatory changes related to green buildings are likely to come about in the near future. In fact, many countries in Asia have set targets to become carbon neutral over the coming decades. In the US, an executive order on climate-related financial risks was signed and investors there will soon need to disclose climate risks, including those in the building sector. So the private sector, governments, financial institutions, and other players in the building sector will need to work together to transform real estate, especially in emerging markets, where the bulk of construction will take place in the coming years and decades, and where green buildings could have the greatest impact. By offering new and innovative climate-friendly products, banks can differentiate themselves and increase their market share, capitalize on the potential of green building sector through sustainable financing. This market represents a growth opportunity too big, too big to be missed. Today's discussion among CEOs from financial institutions and developers can inspire us to think about how we can work together to accelerate finance of green buildings with the Alliance there to support in the transition. Thank you, and I hope you have a great roundtable today and a great discussion. All the best, thank you. Thank you, Paolo. Now may I invite Peter to deliver his keynote speech. Peter, please. Hello, everyone. And thank you to our hosts for the invitation to speak at this important event. All of us at City appreciate HKMA's focus on green financing and investing, 
and on engaging the global financial services community in this effort. Let me start by stating the obvious. We face a critical challenge, which cuts across businesses, communities, and geographies. For decades, evidence of global warming and climate change brought on by human activity has been mounting. But what we once thought was a problem for future generations is in fact an issue that we must face today. The focus of this event, green building, is a key part of mitigating climate change in an area where the finance sector can play a very important role. By providing capital to green construction and building technology, we can make a critical contribution on the path to a low carbon economy and a sustainable future. In promoting green finance, we have a shared set of principles and standards to work from, going back all the way to the equator principles in 2003 and the green bond principles in 2014. And the framework established by the task force on climate related financial disclosures provides an important additional tool for our industry to ensure transparency on climate risk management. Just speaking for our firm, we started reporting on TCFD implementation in 2018. And within this framework, we're measuring and disclosing the risk to our property and operations as a result of climate change. We're also seeing more of our clients taking a systematic approach and building climate change into their capital expenditure and risk mitigation plans. And far beyond just measuring climate risk, hundreds of governments, global corporates, NGOs, and investors, including pension funds and insurers responsible for directing over $4 trillion have committed to carbon neutral investment portfolios by 2050. We too have taken the decisive move to crystallize our targets. On March 1st of this year, her first day as our new CEO, Jane Frazier announced that City as a global franchise would get to net zero by 2050, and that we would get our own operations to net zero by 2030. Of course, our responsibility as a global institution goes far beyond our own carbon footprint. We feel a clear obligation, not just to live by example, but equally to partner with our clients to help them achieve their sustainability goals, decarbonize their businesses, green their portfolios, and together drive the transition to a low carbon economy. By all estimates, the scale of the financing challenge is huge. In order to meet the ambitions of the Paris Agreement, climate financing globally will need to rise to at least 2.4 trillion US dollars per year. A 2020 industry study led by the Global Financial Markets Association and Boston Consulting Group estimated that 100 to $150 trillion will need to be invested globally over the next 30 years to transition to a low carbon economy, with Asia as the single largest destination for these sustainable capital flows. This is an enormous undertaking, which will require all of our organizations to work together. We are committed to doing our part and we're proud of every step along the way. In 2019, we met our $100 billion environmental finance goal. In fact, we were four years early, but we know that like all of us, we need to keep raising the bar. So two months ago, we announced new 2030 targets, 500 billion for environmental finance and 1 trillion for sustainable finance. Focusing in on the new $500 billion environmental finance goal, in order for a transaction to qualify, it must meet one or more established criteria. Renewable energy, clean technology, water quality and conservation, sustainable transportation, green buildings, energy efficiency, circular economy, and sustainable agriculture and land use. Fortunately, as we pursue these ambitious targets, the banking industry is benefiting from the forward thinking of leading global investors. Issuers in many cases can now raise cheaper financing via the issuance of green bonds. Favorable pricing, also known as a greenium, is increasingly benefiting issuers of sustainable bonds with higher oversubscription levels for these transactions, even in challenging markets. This is a function of demand increase, 
We estimate that 10 years ago, less than $5 billion in AUM was dedicated to ESG investments. A decade on, mainstream investors have between 30 and 45 trillion in AUM dedicated to ESG specific investments. A great example of this momentum was Hong Kong government's $2.5 billion green bond, which followed Hong Kong's net zero pledge in January, 2021, on which we were honored to serve as a book runner. This transaction and recent green bond issuances by Hong Kong branches of Chinese banks, all priced at negative new issue concessions in the single digits. As part of our broader sustainable finance commitment, we have been proud to help raise over $25 billion for our clients in Asia Pacific 2021, an increase of some 400% versus 2020. Increasingly though, we are working with our clients more broadly, including not just green finance, but also sustainable and transition financing. This includes opportunities to help buy side clients transition their portfolios to cleaner companies and to pursue M&A opportunities to divest and exit as they move to cleaner energy. We're also putting our own capital to help clients build greener portfolios. In Australia, we finance the property in Perth for a client which has Australian green accreditation to support environmentally friendly real estate projects. Their construction process utilizes renewable energy and recyclable materials, and they require tenants to adhere to recycling policies. A great example of how one market participant can drive positive behavior of others. As the green financing and investing market evolves, we're also focused on co-developing solutions together with our investor clients. These efforts have included the creation of ESG world indices, our first proprietary index to offer a benchmark for best in class ESG performers. And we're also seeing increasing demand from our wealth clients for green investments. Let me now talk a little bit more about our own physical footprint, which includes 7,000 facilities in close to 100 markets. And managing that footprint responsibly, as for all of us, is foundational to drive the right mindset across everything that we do for others. Comprehensive measurement of environmental impact is crucial in this effort. Since 2001, we have worked to measure, manage, and reduce the direct environmental impact of our operations by tracking waste, energy, and water use, as well as greenhouse gas emissions. We also established a sustainability team within city realty services that is responsible for reducing our firm's operational impact on the environment, in addition to protecting our people from climate-driven physical risk. As part of this effort, we are working to leverage climate data to optimize our location strategy, to ensure that site selection and growth properly reflect climate and operational resiliency factors. And we remain committed to further reducing our environmental footprint. As I mentioned earlier, for our own operations, we are targeting net zero emissions by 2030. This builds on our environmental footprint goals and a 100% renewable electricity goal that we achieved in 2020. Our portfolio in Asia covers 9.7 million square feet and our LED certified footprint increased 10% in 2020, and we further reduced our energy consumption and waste consumption in Asia Pacific over the past year. A great recent example of our progress is right here in Hong Kong, where we installed 360 solar panels at our main building in March of this year. The rooftop installation also includes a wind turbine, which generates electricity on site for local use. In addition to all these specific initiatives, we're working hard to focus the culture of sustainability among our 200,000 employees globally. This effort is led by a global sustainability network of over 150 internal partners whose focus and dedication is a source of pride for all of us. Now, let me add a few observations on the critical strategic role of governments and regulators in channeling all these efforts and in encouraging the flow of capital toward climate aligned investment. There are three areas in particular where we believe actions of governments and regulators will make a decisive difference given where we stand as an industry. First, in developing internationally consistent sustainable taxonomies. In a world where both capital and the environmental challenge are truly global, allowing investors to identify sustainable assets across jurisdictions 
will be central to deploying climate capital. Working through global forums, such as the International Platform for Sustainable Finance, governments can foster international harmonization of taxonomies to ensure a shared science-based approach while accounting for developmental differences across economies. In this context, we would note as an example, HKMA's indication that it will adopt the common ground taxonomy being developed by China and the EU. This is one area where regional and global policymaker coordination is key. And HKMA is playing an important part, including through the IFC's Alliance for Green Commercial Banks. Second, Policymaker action will be critical in developing consistent ESG disclosure regimes. Many companies are making disclosures about their approach to ESG, including risks, impacts, and practices. However, a lack of standardization across these disclosures significantly complicates the comparative assessment process for investors. Clear and consistent disclosure regimes would greatly assist investors in their ability to compare activities across jurisdictions and consequently to price and to manage risk. To address this issue, we support the IFRS and other attempts to develop a global common framework, such as the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, with more consistent and robust ESG disclosures to facilitate the investment process. Third, policymaker action will be key in establishing proper mechanisms to, to scale up climate capital. This includes several dimensions. First, carbon pricing. As the IMF and others have noted, without a price on carbon, the market for climate finance will remain subscale. More than 60 jurisdictions are either considering or have already implemented measures in this area, and we urge policymakers to develop and improve market mechanisms to put a price on carbon. Hong Kong's exploration of a shared carbon market framework across GBA and the broader region is an important example of the proactive thinking we will need to move forward at the right pace to make a difference. Second, using catalytic capital. Financing that accepts disproportionate risk, such as blended finance, needs to be ramped up and governments, development banks, and development finance institutions can look at doing more in this important area. We believe that the Center for Green Finance, established under the HKMA Infrastructure Financing Facilitation Office, could be an important forum for developing these sorts of ideas. Finally, scaling up ESG bond issuance. Using internationally aligned standards, such as those developed by the International Capital Markets Association to increase issuance, should be an important part of government efforts to spur climate capital across the region. We applaud Hong Kong's plans to double its green bond issuance levels to 200 billion Hong Kong dollars, as well as to issue retail green bonds. We also welcome the Green and Sustainable Finance Grant Scheme, which provides subsidies for eligible bond issuers and loan borrowers to cover their expenses on bond issuance and external review services. In closing, thank you again for the opportunity to talk through how we are working across our own operations and with our clients to build a greener tomorrow. We remain committed to integrating climate risk into decision-making across our business. And we believe for our industry that only by taking climate risk analytics and pricing into the mainstream will we be able to play our key role to deliver efficient financial market support for a sustainable future. At Citi, we feel that we've made significant strides in governance of climate risk, but we recognize that much more needs to be done to make climate risk a fundamental consideration across all of our businesses in this sector. Hong Kong is rightly and widely viewed as a leader in building a greener future with clear and transparent targets. And we deeply appreciate that leadership. We also know that it will take coordination and cooperation across markets, countries, and regions to achieve a sustainable future across this region and across the globe. And we are committed to play our part. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Well, thank you, Paolo and Peter, for your very inspiring remarks. Uh, I couldn't agree any more that the green building sector represents a growth opportunity that is too big to miss. And that is why um, you know, we have this panel today to explore this um, opportunity further. 
Uh, the Paris Agreement and the UN Sustainability um, Development Goal set out very aggressive objectives in creating more sustainable cities in the world. The building sector is an indispensable part of that because it's a major source of um, carbon emissions. Look, globally, um, buildings and constructions account for almost 40% of uh, total energy-related carbon emissions. So to achieve a net zero carbon building stock by uh, 2050, um, the International uh, Energy Agency estimates that the total carbon emissions from buildings will have to decrease by 50% by 2030. So that's a big challenge for everybody. And in Hong Kong, the power generation accounts for two-thirds of the city's carbon emissions. And because, as you know, Hong Kong is mainly a service economy, um, the buildings in Hong Kong account for 90% of the city's electricity consumptions. So over 60% of Hong Kong's carbon emissions are attributable to electricity consumption by buildings. And therefore, you can imagine that um, buildings, the building sector, really is a major part of Hong Kong's um, sustainability strategy and also a key component of the government's green bond framework. But green building development requires massive financial resources. According to the IFC's um, green building report in 2019, uh, it estimates that um, it requires a 25 trillion US dollar worth of investment opportunities across emerging markets in the region. So in today's round table, we are very fortunate to have a group of CEOs and senior executives of leading green developer, uh, financier, and investor to share with us the journey in green building development. So let me briefly introduce um, our dis distinguished speakers first. And they are um, Ms. Rachel Lott uh, from BlackRock. And as you know, BlackRock is the world's leading asset manager with total asset manage management under uh, BlackRock close to uh, six, 8.7 trillion US dollar at the end of last year. And Rachel is BlackRock's uh, chair and um, um, the uh, head of the Asia Pacific. Uh, and also, he, she's also a member of the global uh, executive committee of BlackRock. And also we have uh, Paul Young uh, from BNP Paribas. As you know, P BNP Paribas Group is um, European leading bank we have a very strong global footprint across 71 markets. And Paul is the CEO and head of Asia Pacific at BNP Paribas with um, you know, responsibility over all business lines in the region. And last but not least, of course, we have Fanny, Fanny Long from um, Swai Properties Limited. Um, she's the finance director of Swai Properties. Swai is uh, one of Hong Kong's leading green developers having investments not only in Hong Kong, but also Singapore, mainland China, and the US. And as finance director, um, Fandi is responsible for managing um, the financial interest of Swire Properties. Now, so today, uh, we're going to split our discussion into two parts. In the first round, our speakers will each share their journey on how to green the real estate sector. So without further ado, maybe let me pose my first question to Fanny. So Fanny, could you share with us, um, you know, Swire Property's commitment to green buildings and also how green financing is supporting that? Thank you, Edmund. Um, green buildings um, help to minimize the uh, impact to the environment, but also improve the well-being of the occupants and also visitors. As part of our commitment to building in a sustainable way, we have set targets um, to require 100% of our wholly owned new developments to obtain green building certification. Um, and um, well, as of 2020, uh, around 97% of our existing buildings have achieved this green building certification, and of which 85% of this certification has achieved that the highest standard of the green building certification, such as uh, the BIM Plus and the NEED Platinum certification standard. Green financing is a very key component to support our green investment and green building investment. As such, uh, we have established a green preferred financing uh, strategy. Our uh, 
Queen Financing Jenny started back in 2018 when we first formulated our green bond framework and issued our first 500 million US dollar green bonds, which obtained the green finance uh, certification from uh, Hong Kong QAA. The net proceeds from our green bonds are used in new or existing green investments that fall into five categories. Number one is uh, green building development. Uh, number two is uh, uh, energy efficiency and also uh, renewable energy, um, sustainable water, and wastewater management. And lastly, on the climate change adaptation. Uh, in 2019, we also launched our first sustainability link loan, uh, making Swai Properties the first company in Hong Kong to establish a financing mechanism that is set against the year-on-year -year improvement in our ESG performance. Within this particular loan structure, the bank will grant an interest rate reduction each year based on two criteria. Number one is um, we need to maintain our listing in the Dow Jones Sustainability Wealth Index. And secondly, we need to achieve our target reduction in terms of the energy use intensity for our Hong Kong property portfolio. And uh, in relation to this sustainability linked loan, I think it was very well received that and we continued it after that particular issuance to have a couple of others, a similar structure in our portfolio. As of 2020 year end, nearly 30% uh, of our uh, loan or bonds facilities came from green financing. And we won't stop there. Our target is to have at least 50% of our loan or green bonds um, facilities to be coming from green financing by 2025 and further increase this particular percentage to at least 80% by 2030. Yeah, well, listening to what Fanny has, has just said, um, we know that um, you know, green building development is really no easy task. It requires a lot of planning, a lot of coordination with um, experts, uh, and most importantly, of course, um, also um, financial resources. So on financial resources, I think that the next logical question must go to Paul. As a leading bank of, um, for sustainable finance, uh, how does BNP Paribas contribute to green financing uh, for the region? Uh, and also what strategy uh, has it adopted to build um, urban resilience in the region? Well, uh, thank you, Edmund. Uh, I, I think, you know, I'm, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for having me here. I think uh, I, I, I listened to Fanny and I, I, I'm so happy that uh, to see where we come from. I think, as you mentioned, BNP has been uh, playing a leading role in the sustainable finance uh, ever since the COP21 in Paris. Uh, and uh, I must say that uh, when we try to uh, bring the awareness of the of the climate change and all these uh, uh, new uh, risks, you know, whether it's ESG, to our clients, I think uh, it has been really an uphill battle, and especially in the beginning, you know, in the 2017, I think uh, most of the the, the real estate uh, clients uh, in Hong Kong, they were, you, you know, it was not like in Europe, so uh, it was something really new. And, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, in the beginning, we obviously feel a little bit lonely uh, in this journey, uh, trying to, 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 to say, okay, you know, uh, this is very clear, climate change is there, uh, the investor uh, will look for more and more sustainability. It is important that, of course, location, quality of the building is important, but uh, as, uh, as uh, you previously mentioned, I mean, during the construction, uh, we are also creating a, a huge uh, green gas uh, and uh, carbon footprint that we obviously uh, need to address. The investor, every stakeholder, the tenants, the, 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 the lenders, uh, you know, uh, and the public at large will all focus. So uh, I think we were quite happy that after the first uh, couple of years, I think it has not been 
that easy that uh, as soon as 2018, I think, uh, Fanny, it becomes, I would say, um, many uh, uh, property developer has become much more conscious. The team was engaged, their team was engaged. Uh, it was no longer to say, okay, what's the sort of a, a, a premium or discount I could achieve on the coupon, etc. But there was a really, I would say, a big momentum that altogether we wanted to, to green the uh, the environment in which we live. And I think that uh, we we have played, I hope, uh, a very uh, a big part in this by, 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 by coming with the ideas, you know, whether it's the, the, the framework for the, for the green uh, and, uh, and then of course, helping our clients in uh, defining what's the targets, uh, whether, you know, what's the sort of a sustainable targets they could achieve. So we started, of course, with uh, the usual uh, green bonds and then sustainable link loan. Uh, at that time, of course, we were, I mean, uh, uh, Fanny mentioned 2018. I think in 2018, we had uh, one of our uh, a deal with, uh, with also a big property developer in Hong Kong, putting uh, some challenges in the sustainable uh, uh, feature target. And then we had, uh, I think, the Marriott uh, in uh, Ocean Park was also uh, build under very strict criteria. So we, we, we have done uh, quite a lot in this field. And, and I think that um, to see that today, I think even year to date, uh, uh, we have already brought to the market either in the form of green bond or sustainable uh, link loan uh, for the real estate uh, sector, more than eight transaction already year to date. And, and I think that uh, 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 thanks, of course, to uh, the regulator, to the to all the stakeholders. I think there is a, a very good push, and uh, and I'm, I'm I'm delighted to hear that you know uh, uh, Fanny was mentioning more than twenty percent of the of their uh, financing will be uh, green, and I think that we can be very optimistic that now the ecosystem and the whole environment that uh, we will be uh, soon reaching uh, a situation where uh, the the green the sustainable finance will become mainstream. Mm. And, uh, and I think that uh, we, we have been uh, really uh, participating in this, uh, whether on the bond sides or whether on the sustainable link loan and also on the derivatives. You know, we, we, we have with uh, some uh, property developer uh, enter into very long dated swaps where uh, the, the, the company uh, commit to certain target uh, upon which he will get some premium, and if he fail, he will be uh, willing to uh, to uh, I would say pay an extra uh, premium. So I, I think it's really a collective effort that uh, for the common goods, for the society, for the environment, that the whole uh, sector is really uh, pushing forward. And I think uh, BNP, uh, as leading in the sustainable finance, is is really uh, happy to have contribute uh, to these uh, to to this to this trend. Yeah, thank you. Um, so from what uh, Fanny and um, Paul have shared, um, you know, we, are, we can already feel the growing momentum of green building development and financing in the region. Now, let me now turn to uh, Rachel. Um, yeah, as you know, real estate is always, um, you know, a major um, class in the uh, alternative asset investment class. So could you share with us the journey of BlackRock on real estate um, investment, particularly around the um, popular theme of climate related uh, real estate investment. Of course, and, and thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, so at BlackRock, real estate is part of our real assets platform. And the team manage around uh, just shy of $30 billion in strategies that span the full risk return spectrum from investment grade and mezzanine debt to equity strategies that target opportunistic investments. And in real estate, our investment approach is underpinned by a strong commitment to sustainable investing and ESG integration, driven by the conviction that sustainability is a core element of financial performance, actually in, in any asset class, but that this is especially true for real estate, given its physical and long-term nature. So real estate is at the forefront of many of the direct impacts of the changing climate, whether that's physical risks such as rising sea levels or flooding or extreme weather events, uh, to transition risks. So for example, emerging policy, legislation, technological advancements um, that aim to mitigate the impact of climate change. And our investors need to be comfortable that we're identifying and underwriting such risks into our underlying investment processes 
whilst also continually reviewing where climatic risk exposures may exist and how they can be managed over time. Here in Asia, we manage a series of real estate funds where ESG has been a central focus for very many years and actually has been used to enhance building performance. So just to give you an example, if I think about um, energy efficiency or water and waste management, those are basic building performance measurements and have been really important for us in improving net operating income for any individual property. Material ESG risks and opportunities are analyzed and recorded throughout the investment process. And we actually don't invest unless our investment committee determines that the ESG risks can be both quantified and mitigated. Thank you, Rachel. Now, now that our guests have already shared the journey of green building development, I would now like to turn to the second round of our discussion with a focus on green building investment opportunities in Asia, as well as other areas for development. Now, let's start with Rachel uh, in this round. Given BlackRock's extensive investment op um, experience in the ESG field, could you share with us um, the changing landscape in terms of opportunities and challenges for green building development in Asia? Yeah, so look, global momentum right now um, that we're seeing towards net zero is dramatically reshaping the economy. And that create risk, that, that does create risks or challenges, um, but it also presents actually what we consider to be a, a historic investment opportunity. And as we're seeing shifting buyer preferences and shifting tenant pre preferences, we think they're going to be winners and losers. The winners are going to be properties that are more sustainable, properties that have higher energy efficiency, lower energy intensity, and therefore with lower operational costs. Winners will also be those properties that are resilient against the impact of physical climate change, such as flood risk, rising sea levels, more frequent and extreme changes in precipitation and temperature. And the losers are going to be the properties that don't adapt. So inefficient building stock with higher operating costs or those at greater risk from physical climate challenge. And this is where we're starting to see the risk of stranded assets. If I think about sort of specific opportunities, um, well, energy auditing and reduction is somewhere to look at. Uh, energy audits undertaken as part of wider refurbishment plans can, can be very effective in identifying opportunities for energy reduction. They have commercial value by identifying operational cost reductions, resulting in significant energy and cost savings. Uh, On-site renewable power, you know, opportunities for the installation of small scale renewables and other on-site energy infrastructure are now feasible. So across our portfolios, we have offices and logistics warehouses with rooftop solar installations that provide re renewable energy directly to tenants with then excess renewable energy being sold back to the relevant national grid. Uh, if you take that further, electrical, electric vehicle charging points can be installed in shopping centers, in retail warehouses and logistical properties. So the whole field of on-site renewable power is actually really important. Uh, if you think about renewable energy procurement, we're exploring opportunities to increase the renewable energy mix within the energy we source for our landlord supplies. For example, if I think about the UK, where I, you know, I've recently come from, um, we've switched our energy contracts everywhere to green tariffs across our real estate, one of our real estate portfolios. And now, actually, we're, we've managed to get it to uh, just over 90% of the portfolio's landlord energy consumption now comes from renewable power. And I think the final point I'd make here, which is both a challenge and an opportunity, is around increasing transparency in financial markets. So again, if I go back to the EU, uh, where we have the sustainable finance disclosure regulations, um, these are actually having quite a big impact. The regulation is focused on preventing greenwashing to ensure that firms deliver their environmental commitments on paper and follow through on those commitments in practice. And I would expect to see evolving regulation in Asia as well, which will also create greater alignment around green real estate investments. So those are, I think, are, are some, of the, some of the highlights of what are opportunities and challenges for green building here in Asia. Okay, um, thank you, Rachel. Um, opportunities are always accompanied by risk. So based on the experience of BNP Paribas, 
Um, how do you see sustainability impact on the credit risk of real estate projects? And how does the bank embrace green building financing opportunities in Asia alongside risk? So, Paul. Uh, thank you, Edmund. Well, I, I think, yes, uh, you know, uh, gauging, assessing risk is really uh, definitely uh, our, our job. I, I think, first of all, in terms of opportunity, there is, uh, as you say, I mean, uh, Hong Kong, especially 90% service sector, so uh, buildings, office, commercial, retail space, there is a huge, uh, I think, uh, opportunity ahead of us. And I think, uh, you know, whether we, we say it on the sustainable bond, on the green uh, uh, bond, uh, on uh, even the derivatives, I think, uh, just think that the, 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 the opportunity is, is huge. Now, what's the risk associated? I think, of course, uh, we, uh, we have been uh, in the past, uh, you know, it was more about location. It was more about the quality of the building. But as, as we say, I think we are more and more uh, in uh, trying to assess the uh, credit risk linked to uh, quality of the building, uh, the quality of the builder, the strategy. I think people will be focusing on how the building was built the, in order to attract uh, the top quality tenants. As Fanny mentioned previously, I think the tenants, especially the big MNC, they will not only look at the grade A, they will look at okay, how you manage the, the waste, how you manage the water, how you manage the energy consumption. Uh, and I think the demand uh, will, will definitely go uh, towards this direction. So when you have this, what's the I would say uh, the, the the risk associated to the to the buildings will obviously the resale value will be the ability to attract top talents at premium, and and uh, if we are lending against this uh, building, if we're lending against, I, I think the, the the credit investor will be much more focused, and uh, and obviously uh, if we do not meet the increasing demand on the green on the sustainable uh, sustainability i think we will be facing a risk of having uh, stranded assets having you know whether the, the the loan to value of the building is 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 uh, is sufficient and uh, the terminal value of the building uh, the ability to have uh, we say a rental income at, at the right level to cover the, the financing so i think all this will be uh, will be definitely uh, mainstream so in the same way, I think that we have seen over the past 40 years, you know, the credit rating from investment grade from AAA to, uh, to, to, to single B, we will see more and more, I would say, the weight of ESG rating and, and how the investor rates uh, uh, such assets, such buildings, uh, you know, on the ESG criteria. And, and obviously, uh, if we are not uh, mindful of that, uh, I would say we will be risk, risking or uh, taking the risk of stranded assets. So long term wise, I think uh, definitely and short term wise, I think more and more we will see people following the ESG rating. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, my next question is for Fanny. Uh, Fanny, as you just shared in the first round, um, you know, Swipe Properties has placed a very strong focus on developing green building. Um, well, can you also um, tell us from the developer, the green de de developer's perspective, how could Hong Kong as an IFC offer to promote the development of green building as well? Uh, I think mainly two areas. Number one is um, communication, and number two is uh, innovation. On communication, I think uh, industry players, uh, including Swipe Properties, as well as the Hong Kong government, need to communicate more about the benefits of building uh, green buildings and low carbon buildings. Uh, uh, and uh, that exactly is the reason why uh, we have been putting quite a lot of efforts in our company to do a lot of communication to the public, to our investors and other stakeholders about our green uh, building journey uh, within our company there. And uh, to start with, um, I think we issued a sustainability report and green finance report on a regular basis. I'm happy to share that uh, Swai Properties was named as one of the top 10 uh, bond, green bond issuers uh, globally by the Climate Bonds Initiative, recognizing um, the comprehensive and uh, transparent disclosure of the environmental impact of uh, our green buildings that are funded by um, the green, uh, green bonds. 
Um, and also, uh, we hold ESG Investor Days, or uh, a webinar, um, in order to update our investors and analysts uh, about the latest company's development uh, on uh, green building, as well as sustainability uh, development performance. And it has always been very welcomed and well received uh, by the stakeholders. And in addition, we realized that uh, just swipe properties alone can't do too much. Mm. And the communication actually extends to general public, as well as our tenants, our staff, our suppliers as well. So back in 2020, we launched a uh, communication engagement campaign called Sustainability We All Count. And this year, um, our focus is on limiting the global warming uh, to, to uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the name of the campaign this year, I'm very happy to announce that this is called Fighting Climate Change We Are All In. So under this particular campaign, uh, there will be quite a lot of actions and the program to be rolled out, including a lot of collaboration and competition uh, with our staff, our tenants, in order to roll out that particular awareness. I think the, the objective of, of all these kind of um, communication is to raise the awareness and try to uh, introduce participation from various parties. On innovation, um, we, we, renewable energy is a very key part of our uh, area of innovation. I just want to share uh, an example for innovation, uh, which is um, in uh, One Taiku Place. One Taiku Place is the first grade A office tower in Hong Kong um, that uh, adopt a biodiesel tri-generation and absorption chiller system. And this system produces on-site renewable energy uh, from biodiesel that is converted from the waste cooking oil collected from our F&B tenants. And we, we convert them into, uh, to generate, uh, to supply energy uh, in a combined form of um, supplying heating, cooling, and uh, power generation for one type of place. And the output constitutes uh, approximately 3.5% of the total energy consumption for one type of place, which is uh, quite good. And uh, we also realized that uh, collaboration with universities and technology companies will make us move faster in terms of innovation. So we have various collaboration with university uh, we work with uh, National University of Singapore and Hong Kong Polytechnic University to develop um, the dual level uh, roof system combining green roof and a solar PV, which is also for energy saving purpose. We have a long term partnership with Tsinghua University's Joint Research Center, and they help us to apply quite a lot of innovative uh, AI and also cutting edge uh, technology on uh, energy saving and also on uh, improving our sustainability uh, uh, performance all across our global operation in swap properties. And uh, we also co uh, develop a cloud-based energy management system with Schneider uh, Electric. Uh, this particular system will enable us to make use of uh, AI and also uh, big data analytics to generate um, uh, data for us to better manage our energy at one type of place, as well as uh, giving us uh, energy saving insights on an ongoing basis. So I think so far uh, our experience tell us that innovation is very important to drive continuous um, uh, initiative in order to reduce the overall uh, carbon footprint in our building. And we will continue to carry on with that then. But thank you, um, Fanny. Um, I think on communication and disclosure, um, we're now working very hard with the banks and other financial institutions on one initiative, which is to enhance the um, climate-related uh, financial disclosure uh, of the banks. I think actually just a few months ago, um, together with other regulators in Hong Kong, we have required um, the banks and other financial institutions to achieve um, TCFD-based um, you know, climate related disclosure um, by 2025. So that is a rather um, major uh, undertaking. 
Um, and we hope that through this initiative, um, the public and also the relevant stakeholders would know more about how banks and other financial institutions have been doing uh, in terms of governance, uh, risk management process, uh, assessment of risk, etc., to address this big issue of climate risk. Now, I think thank you all for sharing. Uh, I'm sure that if um, there is no time constraint, uh, you know, you will still have a lot more to tell us. But I noticed that uh, we have already got some questions um, coming in even before the round table. So let me pick up a few questions for response from, from our speakers. Now, the first question is for you, Paul. Um, what are the challenges and limitations for banks in developing and in developing financial instruments to promote green building development? And how can they overcome these challenges? Well, I, I, I think, you know, uh, wh when you think about it, I mean, a few years back, I think uh, for, for, for us, I would say the main challenge was to really align the interests uh, to convince uh, the the property developer that uh, you know things changing so fast they really need to prepare their, their green framework etc and we were talking you know sometimes the the situation is different whether you talk to the ceo where you're talking to the finance team the finance team obviously have some targets about you know the cost of issuance whether you know and then they say okay if we have to commit to all those sustainability targets it is addition constraint for us, we need to be very careful about what we commit, etc. So what is the plus, the minus? I, I, I think if you look at today, uh, things have become very much mainstream. There is ownership at every level of our clients in the property. And I mean, Fanny mentioned and uh, Reddy, I mean, the, 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 the strategy, it's, it's very clear. So what will be the risk for us, I think, going forward for the banking industry, I think, this mainstreamization of the green is there to stay. But I think that there is going to be a, some sort of a risk around the, what we call uh, you know, the, the, the green washing, mm. uh, where in order to remain top on the league table, um, we become, or the banking industry becomes a little bit more complacent, uh, not you know putting something green just because of the use of proceeds where the company's strategy and the green framework is not really there. So I think, you know, this is, I will see that going forward, uh, of course, the regulator will try to put some taxonomy that will uh, put some discipline, put some standards, you know, uh, uh, so that to bring the, 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 I would say the disciplined industry, but, but the risk will still be the greenwashing. And, and I think that as we face these uh, challenges, it's important that we as financial uh, institutions uh, willing to contribute to the good, we do not deviate from how all this started, which is really to try to mitigate the climate change risk and to stay focused and not be complacent discipline in the targets, in what the company's strategy is, how they're serious about mitigating this. And I think that uh, if we stay, uh, uh, as I say, as disciplined as that, I think you know, we will all together contribute to create a greener world and a greener planet. And, and I think that will, be, uh, that will be the success. And I'm, I'm quite optimistic that we can achieve that. Yeah, but thank you, Paul. Um, now, the next question is for you, Fanny. Um, so from a developer's point of view, what are the advantages of green building um, in terms of financing and, and funding? So uh, in other words, for example, do you get better terms and pricing from the banks you know, for green loan vis-a-vis -vis a lot of green loans? Well, um, definitely the answer is yes. I think when we first started in 2018, um, the greenium uh, that Paul mentioned about may not be so obvious. I think in recent years, particularly um, because of the fact that now financial institutions have allocated more uh, green investment into uh, the green sector. So uh, definitely there would be a much more obvious uh, differentiation between green and non-green. And green buildings uh, being a very major part of our green investment, of course, can contribute quite a lot in the overall sustainability um, uh, development performance of the company. So um, I think the importance of uh, green building is that just because we spend a lot of effort and resources on green buildings, um, the overall sustainability development performance of the company on an overall basis improve. And making use of these improved 
uh, SD performance, we can write on this particular uh, improvement to, um, to, first of all, widen our uh, investor base by talking to bank like Paul, who are very interested to put money into the green investment. And also, um, perhaps we can also capture the greenery, greenium, which is much more obvious uh, in recent years. So um, I truly believe that this particular trend of a widening um, of uh, the funding cost between uh, green and non-green building uh, is going to maintain, uh, and this is an irreversible trend that uh, we have so far seen then. And that would differentiate or even further drive uh, developers like Swire Properties to even do better work in terms of putting more investment to, um, to, to build more green buildings in the future. Then. Yeah, thank you, Fanny. Um, next question here is for Rachel. Um, the, the, I think um, the question is, uh, how, are you, how are your real estate funds being positioned to capture the opportunities in the ESG field? And how do you integrate the ESG factors into your investment process? So, Rachel. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, in order to capture those opportunities ahead, our focus is on building portfolios that uh, reflect evolving client demand, which is, of course, changing. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it, for many years, uh, there was a misconception, in, in our opinion, uh, that to integrate ESG effectively, an investor had to tolerate some kind of a sacrifice on the returns they would get. Now, that misconception, we, we, we never believed in it, and it's certainly no longer the case. Um, and, and when you think about how our clients are now responding, well, our conversations with clients have now evolved significantly beyond this. We're seeing this tectonic shift in client appetite to leverage green investment, investments that actually help clients to tell their own sustainability story and meet their own corporate commitments. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we have an asset in Australia which has its own solar roof panels. The clean energy generates uh, enough power for the whole building uh, and provides income without requiring any additional capital. The clean energy offsets over 13,000 tons of carbon emission, which is equivalent to the energy used by around 1,500 homes in a year, or the equivalent of taking 3,000 diesel or, or petrol driven cars off the road. So as you, as you make those investments, being able to tell those stories are really, really important. And as client demand for ESG continues to accelerate, it's also evolving. You know, the, the, specifically the S component is getting greater spotlight and our real estate funds are, are needing and beginning to adapt to this trend. Our portfolio managers are getting asked more questions about how they consider the social part and what we're doing to, doing to address this across our portfolios. And investors want to see real examples and tangible actions. For example, how are we assessing indoor air quality? How do we understand how the real estate provides a safe, productive and healthy environment for occupiers or users? You know, and I think if I look at if I look into Hong Kong, I can see amongst some of the developers here um, actually the same kind of thinking. Developers are concerned about the communities in which their buildings are built. That that matters a lot. You can't just create a good building. You have to create a community infrastructure that supports that building and supports the community generally. And I think this is a long-term trend which is not going to disappear. I actually think it is going to be um, augmented after the pandemic. The pandemic is going to require developers um, and real estate owners broadly to think about their social license to operate. The social responsibility that they have, and this is what we believe, when you're building or redeveloping assets, we have to provide high quality and safe environments given assets interact with their occupiers and users and the local community. At an individual asset level, um, sustainability is becoming increasingly important for attracting tenants and for the tenants themselves to be attracting their talent if they're in you know, if they're companies. So health and well-being is going to become even more important in a post-COVID world. And our teams have been thinking about this before the pandemic, but the pandemic has simply accelerated and amplified this. If you think about home working here in Hong Kong, Homes are built, they're very small. If we, if we have to have more home working uh, and if we have to have more flexibility, actually landlords are gonna have to provide a better experience to their clients when they're in the office, their tenants when they're in the office. 
residential landlords are going to have to provide a better experience to their tenants when they're in their houses. So the S is just as important as uh, the G, if you like, um, or the E, I suppose, in ESG. All right. Um, I think uh, we still have uh, a few minutes. Um, so in the interest of time, um, perhaps we, we're already close coming to the end of this um, round table. But I think the audience would still like to hear from each of you uh, in just a few sentences. What do you think will be the big ESG themes for um, real estate sector that are coming to play out in the next couple of years? So maybe we can start with Paul first. Well, I, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a strong believer, as we say, I mean, uh, when you look at how uh, Hong Kong, who uh, three, four years ago was not seeing us at the front front, I mean, how fast we catch up uh, in these trends, I think definitely um, the sustainability, the green is going to be there to stay. And I think the investor, the tenants, uh, everybody will want the developer to focus more on the green. And I think that, you know, how serious the building is built, how the strategy of the company, uh, how they are uh, committed uh, and adapting and mitigating the climate change. I think all these factors will be important. And uh, if there is one thing that I think we should never underestimate is the speed uh, to uh, which uh, a mindset uh, expectation uh, change, you know, uh, in, the, in the society. So uh, I, I think, you know, definitely uh, not only we should try to say, okay, let's do the good for the planet to achieve some premium, but uh, it, it may be that if we don't do it, we'll be the only one. And, you know, the access to liquidity even will, could be in danger as soon as, uh, you know, the, the expectation, the regulation, you know, forcing banks or forcing asset managers to disclose all this. And, and I think it's absolutely a, a must that we all need to participate in these uh, in these. Uh, uh, big project of making uh, making a better planet for for us for for the next generation. Thank you, Fanny. Thank you, Emmett. I believe that the key theme will be uh, wellness, particularly um, the pandemic issue is still not yet over us yet. So um, I believe that all sectors will be or all employees will be very focused on. Um, the, 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 the health and well-being of uh, their staff and also uh, their colleagues as well then. Um, I think that pays very well to the strength of uh, Swipe Properties. Um, if we look at one Thai Kuk place, uh, this is the first commercial building uh, in Asia that secured the highest certification, uh, which is the platinum standard for wellness. And uh, as a developer, we see this as our obligation to continue to drive uh, more initiative in order to uh, promote health and also um, sustainable uh, building in that particular area. And particularly, we will continue to have an innovative idea exploring along the line of trying to put more effort into like um, uh, touchness um, a device on the common area, um, and also the uh, restroom area, and, uh, and also to improve the indoor uh, uh, air quality for our building, as well as providing a green open space, uh, just like what we have been doing in the Taiku Place area then. And uh, well, I think this will be the main theme on the wellness then. Well, thank you. Um, Rachel, and, any final words of wisdom from you? Um, yeah, I think there are look there are there are three big disruptors um, which which are connected to the themes. So if you think about the themes, net zero and energy transition, physical climate risk, and health and well being, those are the three three themes. How that's going to play into disruption? Well, you know, climate change is is a massive disruptor. Um, if you look at what's been happening in Canada over the last few weeks, where you know in a in a part of the world that's normally quite cool, uh, temperatures reaching 46 degrees centigrade, which is mind blowing, um, causing devastation, you know. So physical climate risk and transition risk, that's number one. Uh, number two, in terms of, um, as we said before, the, the social and ESG, uh, this focus on indoor air quality, hygiene, active design uh, around things like, you know, do tenants have the ability to have bike racks and, um, alternative commuting ways. So the S is also very big. That's the health and well-being piece. 
And then finally, I think that a disruptor that kind of straddles all of that in terms of those themes is going to be legislation and policy. And we've seen that in Europe. Um, the state of legislation globally varies really very, very considerably, but it is driving momentum in ESG investing and how we investors consider and measure factors, uh, how we disclose our approach and performance on sustainable investing. I think that that legislative side of things and the policy side of things, I would expect to see a significant acceleration in um, legislation and, and policy around the world. And it's going to mean that for real estate, uh, ESG themes are here to stay. Well, thank you all for your sharing. Um, I'm sure our audience um, today would agree that um, your sharing is very informative and full of insight. Uh, if I may try to um, sum up, there are a few key takeaways from um, this round table. Now, first, I think green building financing is a win-win proposition for all stakeholders. From what different speakers have shared, um, green building development could create values for developers, for financiers, as well as investors. For developers, developing green building would not only enhance your brand image or, or recognition, but also enable you to gain better access to uh, you know, green financing. And for investors and financiers, the improved resilience of green building, um, of course, first of all, would reduce risk, um, but also protect and enhance the value of your asset or collateral. Second, there are also plenty of opportunities in green building financing and investment in the region. Uh, and I'm glad to know that um, from all the speakers today, they all recognize that Hong Kong is the key, the leading center for green finance and also a good place for tapping green building development and finance and investment opportunities here. Now, third, um, collaboration among different stakeholders is of paramount importance. Developers and financiers have already set a very good example on how to collaborate on green de building development. And at a more macro level, I think probably the private sector, the government, the regulators, as well as the financial institutions should work closely together to green the real estate sector, especially in the emerging markets where most of these construction activities will take place. So ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our discussion. Once again, I would like to thank Rachel Paul and Fanny, um, and as well as all of you for your participation in this round table. And we look forward to seeing you in our next event. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you everyone for joining the CEO Talk, Building a Green Future today. We hope you all find today's round table insightful. There will be an email sent to each of you with a feedback form. Your suggestion will be carefully considered and highly valuable for us to plan future events of the Alliance. This concludes the roundtable today. Next week, the Alliance will host a practitioner talk, Building a Green Future, where experts and leaders in green building, green finance, and policy making will continue to share their experiences and insights on green building development. We look forward to seeing you again next week Thank you and have a good day.